let me stress that the Turkish people firmly believe that what happened to the Armenians was not genocide. For nine decades, they've denied this ever happened. It's such an anachronism, it's shocking. We have no reluctance to recognize genocide in Darfur. We have no reluctance to talk about the Cambodian genocide or the Rwandan genocide or the Holocaust. Why is it only this genocide? It is incredible that Orphan Pamuk now faces three years in prison for what? For daring to even say that this should be discussed in Turkey today. They are in denial. They covering their tracks. They marked the dead. It's the last major taboo in Turkish politics. The authorities are afraid their own people will find out what happened. Our society, our culture, we do not commit genocide. We will never accept an accusation like that. But for those of you who aren't aware, there was a, uh, a genocide that did take place uh, uh, against the Armenian people. Overseas tonight, a critical American ally is up in arms, quite literally, about something that happened yesterday on Capitol Hill. I see a hypocrisy in not recognizing the, the Armenian genocide simply because there is quote unquote an ally who doesn't want us to do so. Now the White House is warning that Turkey's reaction to what happened in Congress could further destabilize Iraq. Journalist Harand Dink one of the most prominent voices of Turkey's Armenian community was killed by a gunman at the entrance to his newspaper's offices. On January the 19th, 2007, Hrant Dink, a Turkish-Armenian journalist, was gunned down in broad daylight on the streets of Istanbul. His killer, a 17-year-old Turk. The reason? According to the gunman, Hrant Dink had insulted the honor of the Turkish people. To this day, no sentence has ever been passed. In the past few years, cracks have begun to appear in the wall of silence. Pandora's box had been opened in Turkey. Hrant Dink stood up and said, yes, this was genocide. For over 95 years, Turkey has denied that any genocide ever took place. Even today, just to mention it is an offense for which Dink and many others had been prosecuted many times. But all he wanted was for the Turkish people to face up to their past, to the genocide of over one million Armenians, yet a crime which most ordinary Turks know little about. He would say, don't think that they know and they're denying the facts, they're denying something they, they don't know so it was about telling what happened he would say i don't just want those responsible to say that they admitted but i want the entire population to know that who did it and i want to know that it will not happen again although since dink's murder more and more people are starting to question it the official version of turkish history is simple there was no genocide. Even today, it is widely accepted as the truth. Hrant Dink had been fighting a century of official denial. When you say genocide, that's the greatest accusation you could make against a nation. We, the Turkish people, will never accept this. From our point of view, our past is as clean as can be. No one should think we are capable of something like that. An opinion shared by many Turks throughout Europe. Although in recent years, many European parliaments, such as France, Switzerland and Sweden, have acknowledged the genocide against Armenians, many Turks feel personally insulted by this. As in Germany, they demonstrate against any attempt to recognize the atrocities for what they were, 
declaring the subject taboo. But the voices of those who demand Turkey face up to its past can no longer be ignored. This process is certainly going to affect Turkey. Turkey will have to radically change its version of history. I want them to know. I want this to be discussed on every Turkish TV channel, in every newspaper, everywhere. Then Turkey will eventually have to admit, yes, it was genocide after all. We acknowledge that fact. But for now, the Turkish government is unyielding. A key trading partner and the country that provides a bridge to the Middle East, it is too strategically important to risk upsetting. And forcing them to acknowledge an event that happened a century ago is not a priority for the leaders of Western nations. Turkey is a key NATO ally. Although when the situation is about an alliance as important as NATO, which we claim is an alliance based on shared values, then we cannot keep silent about the truth. Too little is being done. Too little is being said plainly. People keep quiet about what they know to be true. Because basically, there is no one in Western Europe who doesn't know that it was a genocide. As Turkey has come under pressure to recognize the genocide, its leaders have used their country's strategic importance to deflect all discussions, threatening to break off diplomatic relations and to cancel arms contracts. Each time the West caves in, and meantime all the Armenian victims and their descendants can do, is wait in vain for official acknowledgement of the truth. You tell your story and you're told not only by the Turkish government or by Turkish uh, citizens, but also by the American government and other Western governments that what you lived through didn't really happen quite that way. Imagine what that would feel like. You, you, you survive and you live with those memories. You tell your truth, a truth you were told you would never get to tell. And then you're told that your truth is, uh, is inadequate or is subjective or is, you know, uh, overly emotional and is inaccurate. Uh, I think it's devastating. Each year, on the 24th of April, hundreds of thousands of Armenians from all over the world make a pilgrimage to Yerevan, the capital of Armenia. Here, they mourn the victims at a monument standing not far from the country where their ancestors were citizens and the mass murder took place, Turkey. For it was there on the 24th of April, 1915, that the annihilation of their people began. Armenians, the world's oldest Christians, call this genocide Ahet, literally the catastrophe. Man muss heute it is time for people to finally accept the truth. And they have to stand up and do something about it to make sure that Turkey accepts it too. It's a sad feeling. It feels as if someone in your own family died. All those memories, the photos you see of people hung, the women, the children. The genocide must finally be acknowledged. After the fight, I said, I dedicate this fight to those who died that day. That day was the 24th of April and I dedicated my fight to them. For the three million Armenians in the tiny Republic of Armenia, along with the five million scattered all over the world, the grief on this day is mixed with pain and anger. They cannot understand why even today Turkey will not acknowledge what happened back then. They feel betrayed and abandoned by a world that still accepts the Turkish version of history. People talk about slaughtered Christians, slaughtered Armenians. On what basis are they making these ugly claims? To accuse Turkey without proof that such a massacre took place in 1915, 
To make such ugly claims against Turkey is absolutely unacceptable. No matter how often it is claimed, we will never accept it, because it never happened. But let them come and present their evidence. Then we will deal with our history if necessary. Deep within the archives of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Berlin lie stored thousands of reports, letters and notes. Once classified papers written and compiled by Turkey's ally during the First World War, the German Empire. Withheld for decades to protect Turkey, these documents leave no doubt about what really happened. There are reports from American and German diplomats, eyewitness accounts by Swiss, Danish and Swedish doctors, missionaries, teachers, nurses and journalists who lived in Turkey at the beginning of the last century and recorded what they saw. Notes on paper long since yellowed with age, their authors dead for decades. Now, 95 years after the event, their testimony will be heard once more. Actors will lend their voices to those witnesses, for the first time letting them speak again. I had the honor to report to the embassy about one of the most severest measures ever taken by any government and one of the greatest tragedies in all history. These people were torn from their homes almost without warning and started toward the desert. Thousands of children and women as well as men died on these forced journeys, not only from hunger and exposure, but also from the inhuman cruelty of their guards. Can you understand what it means to see all that and not be able to do a thing and have to stay alive yourself? They died of starvation by the hundreds, succumbed to typhoid fever by the thousands. Homeless and orphaned children wandered aimlessly everywhere. Long ignored, eyewitness accounts can also be found at diplomatic and military archives in America, France, Denmark, Sweden, and Armenia. Like the reports compiled in Berlin, they too describe the genocide of the Armenians down to the last detail as a road of horrors. These records document the chronology of a crime so great that it is almost beyond human comprehension. It has been no secret that the plan was to destroy the Armenian race as a race. But the methods have been more cold-blooded and barbarous, if not more effective, than I'd first supposed. There were dead bodies in all directions, and on every road. The whole country was one vast charnel house, or oh, more correctly speaking, slaughterhouse. When one sees men and women 70 or even 80 years old, lame, blind and sick, innocent women and children, and helpless babies sent away to be killed or die, and actually sees them dead or dying all around, it is impossible to conceive of any justification that can be urged for a measure so severe.
You cannot accuse the Turkish people as a whole of killing off the Armenians. They didn't want these atrocities, knew little about them, tolerated them but seldom approved of them. The official reports from German consuls in Asia Minor bear witness to that. According to the reports, quite a number of Turkish officials in the provinces refused to carry out orders from their superiors in the capital. During the 16th century, Constantinople was the capital of the vast Muslim Ottoman Empire, which spanned several continents. The world's oldest Christians, the Armenian people, had over time been split between three great empires, Persia, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire, where Armenians lived in six provinces in East Anatolia. By the beginning of the 20th century, two million Armenians live in Turkey. In a Muslim society, Christians are permitted a degree of religious and cultural freedom, but they are also required to pay special taxes and are routinely discriminated against. Despite being granted limited autonomy, they do not have the same rights as Muslims and are treated as second-class citizens. The Armenians complain about their lowly status and in vain demand political and social equality Although many are tradesmen, farmers and craftsmen, in the towns a prosperous Armenian middle class emerges. Some of these people were from wealthy and refined circles. Some were accustomed to luxury and ease. There were clergymen, merchants, bankers, lawyers, mechanics, tailors and men from every walk of life. But despite repeated promises of equality, over the years, tens of thousands of Armenians fell victim to pogroms, state-supported violence designed to keep them in their place. In 1895, 200,000 had been killed protesting against high taxes and demanding equal rights. Then, in 1908, revolution erupts in Turkey. Officers and liberals in exile, called Young Turks by Europeans, seize power again promising freedom and equality for all minorities. In reality, they had a very different agenda. With the success of the Young Turks in 1908, a new idea came to the predatory minority that ruled and robbed Turkey. It was Turkey for the Turks. It was not the result of religious fanaticism, although it brought into play the fanatical passions of the masses. But on the part of the government, it was largely for the spoils and the power. The new party calls itself the Committee of Union and Progress. The old Sultan is overthrown and his brother installed as the head of what is now a constitutional monarchy. The Young Turks plan the creation of a new racially pure empire, claiming they want to free the Muslim world from the dominance of the infidel. The once mighty Ottoman Empire is severely weakened by the loss of Christian territories in the Balkan War of 1912, a humiliation they also blame on Christians living in their own country. Power lies with the triumvirate of three high-ranking officials called Pasha in Turkish. Enver Pasha as war minister, Jamal Pasha as minister of the navy, and last but not least, the all-powerful minister of the interior later to become head of government, Talat Pasha. He came from a very humble background. He began as a postman and mail courier on the route to Adrianople. Then he worked as a telegraph assistant and in other departments at the post office. That's not a stigma, quite the opposite. He had astonishing energy and intelligence. But even so, his great intellectual capabilities didn't stop him from harboring the most narrow-minded, chauvinistic delusions. It was as if he was poisoned with a kind of racist fanaticism. My impression then and now, Talat Pasha was the absolute dictator of Turkey. I had two interviews with him. Talat Pasha looked strong and powerful. He was like a great American political boss. 
Only if he would have been an American boss, he would be the king of bosses. He was a born master executive. After seeing the leading men of the Central Powers, I should say that Talat Pasha was the strongest man between Berlin and hell. 1914 and the First World War. The Russians advance from the east. To the west, England starts an offensive on the Dardanelles Strait. Turkey feels threatened by a Christian Europe, except for the German Empire. Turkey now fights at its side. The German, the Turk, and the devil made a triple alliance. At a state reception in Constantinople, the German Kaiser greets Turkish officials. To his right stands War Minister Enver Pasha. In the race for influence in the Middle East, Germany seeks an alliance with the Ottoman Empire. They offer to modernize the Turkish army and help restore the country to its former glory. The fate of Armenians is not an issue for the Germans. Economic and military interests do not permit any conflict with their new ally. First of all, Germany's conduct was extremely cowardly. We had the Turkish government in our hands, from a military, a financial, and even a political point of view. If we had only wanted to, we could have insisted on observance of the most basic principles of humanity. Enver Pasha, and to a greater extent Talat Pasha, the Minister of the Interior and actual dictator of Turkey, didn't really have any other choice but to obey the terms Germany set. They would have obeyed any directive from Germany regarding the Armenian issue. The Ottoman government felt that with Germany as its ally, it need have no fear of any future retaliations for its plan of complete extermination. As it was convinced that Germany would win the war and would shield Turkey from the vengeance of the Western powers and of Russia. And so the crime was worked out systematically. In the winter of 1914, the Russian army advances into the Turkish-Armenian districts. Soldiers of Armenian origin fight on both sides. Enver Pasha himself is in command of the counter-offensive in the Caucasus region. But his campaign ends in crushing defeat. 90,000 Turkish soldiers die within a few weeks. The Young Turks government places the blame on a Russian-Armenian conspiracy on fraternization among Christians. It was their only explanation for the fiasco and an opportunity to denounce all Armenians as enemies. There is no doubt that they used the war for this, because the hostile great powers no longer had any influence on Turkish soil. And in any case, apart from America, they were fully occupied with the war. So there was no time, no one found the time, to concern themselves with the Armenian issue. The young Turks spread rumors that their Armenian soldiers had defected to the Russian side a fabrication built on treason with tragic consequences. Thousands of Armenian soldiers are arrested, tortured and killed as a direct result. Only by using tricks such as that were they able to carry out their systematic extermination of the Armenian people. The Turkish government skillfully manipulated public opinion worldwide and then discovered... No, they arranged local conspiracies. The governor of the city of Van, a brother-in-law of Enver Pasha, prepared an attack on the town's Armenian district. The Armenians barricaded themselves in their neighborhoods to protect their families against the impending massacre. They had no connection with Russia whatsoever. For four weeks they held out against Turkish troops who laid siege to them and fired upon them. Under cover of the turmoil of the fighting between Turkey and Russia, Turkish troops attacked the Armenian population in Van supposedly to crush an uprising there. The Armenians put up a bitter resistance. Many thousands die. The fighting only stops when Russian troops force the Turks to retreat. As the Russians march into Van, for the Turks, this is yet more proof of a Russian-Armenian conspiracy. 
It was used as a pretext to slaughter, for every guilty one, 10,000 innocent people, to assault women and children in the most brutal fashion. While Turkey's ally Germany deemed an objection to be inappropriate. It begins with expulsions, supposedly to secure the border with Russia. The authorities claim the Armenians would be settled in Syria, then a part of the Ottoman Empire. A lie. The first Armenian families are sent off on a march to certain death. But the Turkish government intended to get rid of all Armenians. Of course, they could hardly use the pretext of a wartime evacuation for the entire population. Those people lived hundreds of miles away from the Eastern Front and the Dardanelles. So a different reason had to be found. Suddenly and miraculously, the government discovered a universal conspiracy amongst Armenians throughout the empire. The authorities whip up passions amongst the Turks. They claim the only way to avoid military defeat is to eliminate the Armenian threat throughout the country. A new deportation act, carefully refraining from naming the Armenians explicitly, retrospectively justifies the measures taken so far and instructs the army to, as they claim, resettle the populations of any towns and villages suspected of committing acts of treason or espionage. Once holy war was declared, we could all see where it would lead. They made inflammatory speeches stating, since we're at war with Christians, we need to wipe them out in this country first. Besides, the Turks expected the Russian troops would advance at least as far as Mush. But, as they put it, before that happens, we'll slaughter the Armenians first. The arrests in Constantinople began on the 24th and 25th of April. 850 people, Orthodox Christians, Protestants and Catholics were deported. Among them were 10 bishops, 40 doctors and 10 lawyers, but also many middle or working class. There were very few Turks with whom you could speak frankly about the Armenian issue. Even otherwise quite sophisticated and cultured people would fly into a rage. They saw all Armenians as the same tarred with the same brush, constantly repeating, the Armenians must be wiped out, they're all traitors. And what did the Turkish government have to say about this? I quote, the Ottoman government extends its benevolent protection to all honest and peace-loving Christians living in Turkey. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that statement and I still can't find words to describe the utter hypocrisy of it. The Turkish government is responsible for everything that has happened. It's no use their denying it. They were the ones who deliberately drove the Armenians into this chaos. The police fell upon them, just as the eruption of Vesuvius fell upon Pompeii. Thrown. Women were taken from the wash tubs. Children were snatched out of bed. The bread was left half-baked in the oven. The family meal was abandoned, partly eaten. Children were taken from the schoolroom, leaving their books open at the daily task. And the men were forced to abandon their plows in the fields and their cattle on the mountainside. These people were torn from their homes, almost without warning.
The Armenian men who were arrested were put in stocks. Their feet were shod with nails like horses. Beards, eyelashes, fingernails, and teeth were torn out. They were strung up by the feet. And similar things. Of course many of them died, but missionaries were able to treat some, which is how we got to see these injuries. For several days there were rumors of this, but it seemed incredible. On Saturday, June 28, 1915, it was publicly announced that all Armenians were to leave after five days. The full meaning of such an order can scarcely be imagined by those who are not familiar with the particular conditions of this isolated region. A massacre, however horrible the word may sound, would have been humane in comparison with it. In a massacre, many escape, but a wholesale deportation of this kind in this country meant a lingering and perhaps even more dreadful death for nearly everyone. When the town crier announced the deportation of the Armenians, Turkish police came and ordered men on this side, women on the other. They herded us like sheep. They drove us out of our houses and off our land. Many Muslims, Turks and Arabs, shook their heads in disapproval unable to hide their tears. They couldn't believe that their own government could have ordered these atrocities. All the Armenian houses in Trebizond had been emptied and the people sent off. There was no inquiry as to who were guilty or innocent of any movement against the government. If a person was an Armenian, that was sufficient reason for being treated as a criminal and deported. On the 24th of May, 1915, England, France and Russia declare the events in the Ottoman Empire a crime against humanity. The first time this term had ever been used. At this point, America is still neutral and therefore not at war with Turkey. Their ambassador meets with Talat Pasha to protest against his government's brutal actions. After the exchanging of compliments, we settled down to the business in hand. I've asked you to come today, began Talat Pasha, so that I can explain our position on the whole Armenian subject. We base our objections to the Armenians on three distinct grounds. In the first place, they have enriched themselves at the expense of the Turks. In the second place, they are determined to domineer over us and to establish a separate state. In the third place, they have openly encouraged our enemies. They have assisted the Russians in the Caucasus, and our failure there is largely explained by their actions. We have therefore come to the irrevocable decision that we shall make them powerless before this war is ended. This was no less than the deportation of the entire Armenian population. Not only from this province, but I understood from all six provinces comprising Armenia. 
an undertaking greater probably than anything of the kind in all history. With a map of Anatolia in his hand, one of Talat Pasha's closest aides confirmed to me the Turkish government had decided to step up the deportation of the Armenians even further. Now Armenians in the provinces of Yanik, Trabzon, Zivas and Mamuretul Aziz would also be deported to Mesopotamia. This could no longer be justified on any military grounds as Talat Pasha himself confirmed to me, its purpose was to wipe out the Armenians. Suppose a few Armenians did betray you, I said to Talat Pasha. Is that a reason for destroying a whole race? Is that an excuse for making innocent women and children suffer? Those things are inevitable, he replied. The weeping and wailing of the women and children was most heartrending. The German consul told me that he did not believe the Armenians would be permitted to return to Trebizond even after the end of the war. It wasn't easy for the young Turks, who decided to deport and exterminate the Armenians, to annihilate a people in the millions. The deportations went on for a whole year. It is impossible for me to give any adequate idea of the panic in this locality that has resulted from the announcement of this order of expulsion. Everyone who was obliged to leave was trying to get together a little money to take on the journey. The Turks, of course, were taking advantage of this situation to get things at practically nothing. Robbery and looting were never undertaken in a more wholesale manner. Turkish men and Turkish women were entering the houses of all the Armenians and taking things at almost any price. The scene reminded me of vultures swooping down on their prey. All felt that they were going to certain death. And they certainly had good reason to feel that way. The furniture, bedding and everything of value was being stored in large buildings about the city. There was no attempt at classification, and the idea of keeping the property in bales under the protection of the government to be returned to the owners on their return was simply ridiculous. The goods were piled in without any attempt at labeling or systematic storage. As a matter of fact, the Turks never had the slightest idea of settling the Armenians in this new country. They knew that the great majority would never reach their destination, and that those who did would die of thirst and starvation. The real purpose of the deportation was robbery and destruction. The 
Constantinople ensured the destruction of the Armenians by ordering regional governors, mayors and local officials to annihilate them. Those civil servants who disobeyed were dismissed. Anyone else who expressed disapproval, officials, the military, the public, was terrorized. Not just one, but a number of officials are reported to have been executed because they weren't ruthless enough with the Armenians in their districts. We asked permission for two or three of the missionaries to go with them. This was refused. We were allowed to buy things from them, but not to store things. They were told they were to go to Urfa. Then we began to buy their things and give money to the poor, making knapsacks and filling them with bread and handing them out. At first we wept till it seemed that for the rest of our lives we could never do anything again but weep. Then the true horror of it began to weigh down on us, and then we found it impossible to weep. The crime that was committed here was so immense that even during the war, its echo was heard everywhere, except in Germany. Berlin knows perfectly well what has been going on. But neither Jamal Pasha, here on horseback, nor any other member of the government see any reason to justify their actions to their German ally. And Germany tacitly accepts their allies' crimes, all in the national interest. We Germans, soldiers and civilians alike, were outraged. It was incomprehensible. Instead of disassociating itself from the Turks through its silence, the German government has turned us into accomplices. It is with good reason that both our enemies and neutral nations have accused us of condoning these crimes by remaining silent. What the Turks did was actually our work. It was our officers, our guns, our money. Without our help, a puffed-up frog would have collapsed in a heap. We didn't need to be so gentle with them. To succeed in the Armenian issue, all we had to do was to instill in the Turkish government a fear of the consequences. Our admonishments achieved nothing. It just annoyed them. I warned at the time, if for military reasons we can't be firm with them, then we'll have no other option than to look on as our ally continues to massacre. In my opinion, reprimanding an ally in public during an ongoing war, as proposed by Ambassador Metternich, would have been absolutely unprecedented. Our sole objective was to keep Turkey on our side until the end of the war regardless of whether Armenians perish or not. It was clear to me that we would need the Turks if the war carried on much longer. I didn't understand how Metternich could even make such a suggestion.
liefen 110 Tage. We walked for 110 days, almost without a break. The old and the sick, who could walk no more, were abandoned on the side of the road or killed by the police. They drove us onwards. We were hungry. They didn't even let us have anything to drink. At first, the Armenians from eastern Anatolia are marched to the city of Orfa. Armenians from Constantinople and western Turkey are sent towards Aleppo. Then from these two cities they are forced to walk into the Syrian desert near Diyazor or out into the steppes of Mesopotamia. In reality, the alleged resettlement is a death march to nowhere. The state of the deported people defied description. They went out in droves and ate grass from the fields. If they came across a dead camel or some other beast, they fell upon it and fought over it as if it were a treasure. The Turkish government deliberately set about the destruction of as much of the Armenian population as possible using methods borrowed from antiquity. Such methods, however, did not become a government that wished to be allied with Germany. The work was not just done by bands of Kurds, but has for the most part been that of the police who accompanied the people from here, or by companies of armed convicts who have been released from prison. for the sole purpose of murdering the Armenian exiles. Kurds and bandits attacked us, robbed everything we had, and kidnapped girls and young women. I remember that my mother-in-law was pregnant. They murdered her. They rammed a sword into her belly, pulled the baby out, then began to laugh because it was a boy. They threw him down on the ground. I'll never get those images out of my head. The route leads the deportees across steppes and mountains, alongside the banks of the river Euphrates. Few German soldiers venture to rescue Armenians from their inevitable fate. Faced with their allies' absurd explanations, they're powerless to act. When the Turks killed the men on the marches, they used the excuse that they had to protect themselves against rebellions. When women and children were raped and kidnapped, then the Turks used the excuse that they didn't have a grip on the Kurds and the police. When they let the deportees starve, then they used the excuse that the difficulties in supplying food on the march were so great that they were unable to overcome them. My 
My mother and brother were very sick. We simply left them under a tree along the way. It didn't matter anymore. Sooner or later they would have died anyway. Then a different kind of chaos began. They took the young girls. Many of them fled and tried to hide. Eventually, I just collapsed somewhere, all alone. I saw many girls this had happened to, who then drowned themselves in the river Euphrates. I didn't do that. By then the sun was setting and I was still lying there on the ground. But I thought to myself, soon it will be night and then wolves will come and tear me apart. So I got back up on my feet again and marched on. Out there the men were killed. The girls carried away. And the women robbed and left. We didn't know what was still to come. The persecution of Armenians in the eastern provinces entered its final phase in July 1916. Nothing could deter the Turkish government from its program. Neither our own petitions, nor appeals from the American embassy and the papal delegate. Not even threats from the Triple Entente powers. And least of all any consideration for public opinion in the West. There are cattle cars on the Baghdad railway for transporting goats and sheep. They are split into two decks, so that animals can be loaded top and bottom. The deportees were loaded into these cars, like animals. It was impossible to stand up. They could only kind of crouch, and hardly even that because the cars were so overloaded. Men, women, children, the healthy and the sick were bundled in together and transported for days. The railway from Constantinople to Baghdad had been built under German planning and supervision. For around 100,000 Armenians from the western Anatolian region near Bursa and Izmet, the Baghdad railway becomes a journey to certain death. They have to pay for their tickets. Every day, thousands were transported by train. The sick and dying were loaded on with the rest. When they died, they were simply offloaded at the next station. Bodies were even found thrown down the railway embankments between the stations. Even more horrifying accounts were given by railway engineers after they returned home. Near Tel Abiyad and Razulain, they found piles of defiled, naked women's bodies lying on the railway embankment. Many had clubs forced into their anuses. The director of operations for the Baghdad Railway, a native Swiss, told me he'd seen many things in his life, things that had hardened him. But he never imagined something like this was possible. You can see why General Pasha had issued a strict ban on photographing the deportees. The ban made the photographing of Armenians as prohibited as taking unauthorized photographs in a battle zone. Nevertheless, some German soldiers did manage to capture the Armenians' plight on film and smuggle the photos out of the country. Their pictures are a precise record and shocking proof of the first systematic genocide of the 20th century. 
The worst thing was to see the horde of orphan children grow day by day. On the perimeter of a tent town, hollows had been dug in the ground for them, covered by old rags. They sat beneath them, head to head, boys and girls of all ages, neglected, like animals, starved without food, without bread, huddled together, shivering in the cold of the night, and no one to offer them even the most meager help or comfort. The children's eyes stared at eyes sunken from their suffering, a look of bitter reproach against the world on their faces. The German consul from Mosul, Mr. Holstein, reported that on some segments of the route from Mosul to Aleppo, he had seen so many chopped off children's hands that one could have paved the road with them. Numerous reports from the German consulates in Aleppo and Mosul document far worse examples than the few I offer here. The last refuge for the Armenians are the children's homes, hospitals and orphanages run by Western missionaries. Doctors and nurses battle to save at least the children. They soon realize that rescuing them is the only way for the Armenian race to survive. At this point, mention must be made of the actions taken by the Turkish government against the orphanages, hospitals and schools, maintained by German and American associations for the benefit of the Armenian people. Every day, the authorities threatened the few institutions that had not yet been closed down with the deportation of their Armenian staff, schoolchildren and orphans, as well as other measures. The Turkish government's intentions were revealed by their systematic blocking of any form of relief aid offered by missions, nuns and Europeans living in the country. An offer made by the American government to take deportees to the USA aboard American ships at America's expense was flatly rejected. At that time, with just a brief, curt order, the Turkish government took nearly a thousand children from my care. The last I saw of them was when they were carried off by that special train. And with that, a veil of darkness was drawn over them and me. Of those who had lived in our home, almost all have been beaten or starved to death, or have disappeared. Only six survived, three finding their way back. As for the others, I have received very little news. Crippled Mariam Badja starved to death. Blind little Livon, too. Khatun, also blind, is said to have been drowned in Lake Gulchik. Lake Gulchik is a mountain lake near Mezari in which thousands of Armenians were drowned. I spoke forcefully to both Enver Pasha and Jamal Pasha about the Armenian atrocity. But citing wartime necessities, they said that insurgents must be punished. 
ignoring the fact that hundreds of thousands of women, children and old people were being killed. The Turkish government did damage both to us as their ally and to themselves. The only route they had for a campaign against Egypt was blocked by tens of thousands of deportees and contaminated with disease. Yet at any moment, they could have needed the road for troop movements. In the midst of the First World War, strategic military considerations vital to the war effort are ignored by the Turkish government again and again. The deportation is its top priority. Thousands are killed along the way. Those who survive the journey eventually reach the town of Urfa, where they are herded together in a camp. There, they await their fate. For hundreds of thousands, Orpha had become the transit point on their way to the steppes of Mesopotamia. Conditions aboard the trains grew sadder and ever more wretched. There were no more men among the deportees. The trains contained only women and children between the ages of 4 and 12. They had numbered thousands when they set off together, but only small groups made it to Urfa. Once when I appeared at the deportees' camp with bread, the women called out to me, what is the use of bread? Why bring us bread? The only thing that awaits us is death. Bring us poison so that we can die here. Please don't let us be taken away. You know what awaits us when we reach the steps. And the mothers with their babies. Their breasts had long since gone dry. No other food existed. Few mothers found the courage to drown their children in the river to release them from their suffering. Instead, they were laid in the yard, row upon row. There they cried for as long as they could. When the crying stopped, they gasped for air a few more times, until death released them. It was an avenue of death that stretched from Orpha's walls far, far out onto the scorched yellow plains. And that avenue was well planted, but it wasn't shaded by lush green trees. Corpses lined the path, bodies in every stage of decomposition. Some had died right outside the city gates beaten from their sick beds by blows from truncheons, they managed to drag themselves on for a few hundred meters. Then they collapsed. And no torture in the world could have made them get back up again. They gasped their last breath and were freed from their suffering. It was almost impossible to bear. We came across several groups of Armenian women and children. It was a dreadful sight. The policemen who accompanied them told us frankly what they did to these poor people en route. When we asked, where are they headed? They said, if no one else gets them, or they don't die, we'll just have to kill them ourselves. For those who don't die of hunger or thirst and aren't beaten to death during one of the countless attacks, their journey to death finally ends on the steppes of Mesopotamia or in the Syrian desert near Deir Zor. In Deir Zor, a small town on the Euphrates, a large concentration camp had been set up for Armenians from all over Turkey. 
When I was there, there were only around 60,000 people left, mostly walking skeletons. Famine had distorted their features. Their faces looked barely human. At the entrance to the camp I visited at that time, there was a pile of unburied bodies right next to people's tents. Everyone was suffering from severe diarrhea. The filth in and around the tents was beyond description. The Turkish burial squads worked from morning till night, but they still couldn't cope with all the work. An elderly policeman said that he'd been here for 25 days. He believed the Armenians had got their just deserts because some had worked against the government. Still, he said it would be better if they were just shot, not slowly tortured to death. He could stand it no more and would surely lose his mind if he had to witness this boundless misery any longer. I once found a stack of human skeletons piled on top of each other in a gorge. White skulls still covered with hair, a pelvis, a child's rib, delicately curved like a clasp. At that moment I was overwhelmed by a dull despair that brought tears to my eyes. As if I would have to extinguish all hope, all the seeds of love that had ever bound me to life. Similar tragedies were reported from all over Turkey. Wherever desert sands border an inhabited region, hundreds of thousands of dead bodies. I'll read from the notes I made back then. One o'clock in the afternoon, a young woman lies on the left side of the road, naked except for brown socks. She lies on her stomach, head buried in her crossed arms. Half past one, to my right, an old man with a white beard in a ditch, naked, lying on his back. Two steps beyond, a boy, naked, on his stomach, left buttock torn away. Two o'clock, five fresh graves. To my right, a man with exposed lower body and bloodied genitals. 3.45 p.m., the bloodied skeleton of about a ten-year-old girl, long blonde hair, next to 22 fresh skeletons graves. A man, body of a smoddy girl, a woman clutching a baby, lies in the middle of the road of one day, arms and legs, spread wide of the chest, a vulture circles above the scene. One day, Talat Pasha made what was perhaps the most astonishing request I had ever heard. The New York Life Insurance Company and the Equitable Life of New York had for years done considerable business among the Armenians. I wish, Talat Pasha then said, that you would get the American Life Insurance Companies to send us a complete list of their Armenian policyholders. They are practically all dead now and have left no heirs to collect the money. It, of course, all should go to the state. The government is the beneficiary now. Will you do so? This was almost too much, and I lost my temper. You will get no such list from me, I said, and I got up and left him. In 1918, victorious Allied forces march into Constantinople. 
Turkey, along with Germany, has lost the war. The young Turks are removed from power, and the parliament they had suppressed charges those responsible for the genocide. In 1919, Turkish courts sentenced the main perpetrators to death in absentia. Enver Pasha, Jamal Pasha, and head of government Talat Pasha, with Germany's assistance, had been able to escape on a German warship. Talat Pasha flees to Berlin, where under an assumed name, he and his wife lead a secluded but comfortable life. As for the crimes committed by their loyal ally, Germany remains silent. But on the 15th of March, 1921, Talat Pasha is shot dead in the middle of Berlin. The assassin is caught at once. He states that although he did kill a man, he is not a murderer. The assassination makes headlines around the world, but it would be decades before the perpetrator is revealed as a member of an Armenian group seeking revenge. The deed brought Germany's attention to the genocide for the first time. A single shot fired by the young assassin, Solomon Talirian. The, the pistol shot fired by Talirian, an unknown Armenian student, and the trial that followed once again drew the eyes of the world, and for the first time those of the German people too, to the bloodiest chapter of the war. The truth was out. The systematic annihilation of the Armenian people by the young Turks. The trial takes place at the Tiergarten Municipal Court in Berlin. German diplomats are prohibited from testifying. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs doesn't want the trial to focus on the genocide or Germany's role in the atrocities. After just three days, Talirian is acquitted. The impact of the events discussed during Talerian's trial was so devastating that despite the obviously violent killing, the jury found him not guilty. Despite all the efforts to keep this trial non-political, the verdict reverberated around the world and obtained historical significance. Without saying so directly, the jury had acknowledged that the destruction of an entire people could not go unpunished. As a young student in Poland, Rafael Lemkin had been following the trial. It would lead him to draw up the United Nations Convention on Genocide. Tellurian had appointed himself as the executioner of the conscience of mankind. Yet can anybody appoint himself to carry out justice? At this moment, the murder perpetrated upon an innocent people held a greater significance for me. I still had no definitive answers, but the certain feeling that the world had to promulgate a law against this form of racially or religiously motivated murder. Sovereignty cannot be misunderstood as the right to kill millions of innocent human beings. It would take another 30 years before Lemkin's ideas become reality. But in 1920, at the peace conference in France, the Armenians are promised that those responsible for the genocide would face international condemnation. But three years later, Kemal Atatürk, the new head of the Turkish government, is once again seen as a key ally of the West. Strategic issues take precedence. Atatürk demands a high price for this new alliance. His opposition to any prosecutions or an independent Armenian state in Anatolia is conceded. In addition, he refuses to allow the surviving Armenians to return to their old homes. Attempts to get the new Turkish government to allow the refugees to return to their Anatolian homeland were futile. The Turks hid behind the pretext that the refugees' return constituted a danger to the Turkish army. The survivors of the genocide are a few women, but above all, children. They are kept either as house slaves or forced into harems. 
Defenseless, they are subjected to repeated abuse. Tirelessly, missionaries attempt to save those they could. It was enough to make you lose all hope. How are these remnants of the Armenian people supposed to cope? And the many, many fatherless children. They simply overwhelmed them. We were sick with worry for them. After the war, my wife and I were able to bring 8,000 children to Lebanon. From Haput, 5,000 children had to be shipped out, so each group had to be as large as possible. During the three months of the transports, I twice managed to send around 700 children on their way at a time. Those were great days. How the children's faces beamed as they set off on their journey. Surely the Israelites couldn't have been happier when they left Egypt. It is thanks to people like Jakob Kunzler, here on the right, that up to half a million Armenians survived the Young Turks' genocide. The survivors, all now over a hundred years old, find new homes in places such as Lebanon, France and the USA, or the Caucasus, where a new, tiny Armenian Republic is founded. In Turkey itself, only about 60,000 Armenians remain, and of those, only a few acknowledge their origins. television in cooperation with the United Nations. And combining the Greek word genos, uh, genos meaning race or group, with the root of the Latin sidere meaning to kill. Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who is a professor of law at Yale University and specializing in teaching uh, matters about the United Nations. Dr. Lemkin is the man who created the word genocide. Dr. Lemkin, could you give us a little background on how you came To be interested in this genocide fight. Dann wie dieser Kampf bei ihnen begann. To be interested in this genocide fight originally. I became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. It happened to the Armenians and uh und auf der Friedenskonferenz in Frankreich wurde ihnen auch noch übel mitgespielt, da die Verbrecher, die den Völkermord begangen haben, letztendlich nicht bestraft wurden. 1943 wird der Leichnam von Talat Pascha von den Nationalsozialisten in einem pompösen Staatsakt von Berlin in die Türkei überführt. Für die Nazis ist der für die Täter folgenlos gebliebene Völkermord an den Armeniern eine historische Tatsache, die sie in ihren eigenen Vernichtungsplänen bestärkt. Vor Oberkommandierenden der Wehrmacht erklärt Adolf Hitler bereits am 22. August 1939, wenige Tage vor dem Überfall auf Polen, ich habe meine Totenkopfverbände bereitgestellt mit dem Befehl, unbarmherzig Mann, Weib und Kind polnischer Abstammung in den Tod zu schicken. Er fügt hinzu, wer redet heute noch von der Vernichtung der Armenier? Hitlers zynische Frage macht deutlich, es war tatsächlich möglich, ein gigantisches Verbrechen zu organisieren, ohne dafür international zur Verantwortung gezogen zu werden. And, however, uh, no action was taken. Und da keiner handelte, glaubte Hitler, handeln zu dürfen. Und das bewog die Welt nun doch, endlich etwas zu tun. Ich sagte mir, ein solches Verbrechen sollte bestraft werden, und zwar nach internationalem Recht. Raphael Lemkin entwirft die Anti-Völkermordkonvention der Vereinten Nationen, die 1948 von den meisten Mitgliedstaaten verabschiedet wird, zwei Jahre später auch von der Türkei. 
Die von den Türken angewandten Methoden wie Enteignungen, Selektionen, Deportationen, Todesmärsche und Todeslager wirkten nicht nur auf Lemkin wie eine Blaupause für den Holocaust und weitere Völkermorde. Diese Konvention soll so schnell wie möglich von allen Staaten unterzeichnet und von allen Parlamenten ratifiziert werden, um grundlegenden Menschenrechten völkerrechtlichen Schutz zu gewährleisten, zum Wohle des Fortschritts, des sozialen und internationalen Friedens. Die Leiden armenischer Männer, Frauen und Kinder, die in den Euphrat geworfen oder auf dem Weg nach der Zor massakriert wurden, haben den Weg zur Annahme der UN-Genozidkonvention vorbereitet. Der Mord am armenischen Volk wurde von den Vereinten Nationen als Völkermord geächtet. Und obwohl die Täter nach dem Ersten Weltkrieg selbst von türkischen Gerichten in Abwesenheit zum Tode verurteilt wurden, werden sie bis heute in der Türkei verehrt. So stehen mitten in Istanbul zwei monumentale Ehrenmale für Enver Pascha und Talat Pascha, so als seien ihre Verbrechen niemals geschehen. Das alles liegt in der Vergangenheit. Wir sollten jetzt in die Zukunft schauen. Wenn man in die Vergangenheit zurückkehrt, kann man nicht vorwärts schreiten. Das sage ich im Rahmen meiner Meinungsfreiheit. In Istanbul, Ankara und überall in der Türkei findet man Straßen mit den Namen der Täter. Talat Pasha Boulevard, Talat Pasha Platz, Enver Pasha Straße. Auch scheint nichts Anstößiges daran zu sein, eine Grundschule nach einem Verantwortlichen für den Völkermord zu benennen. Das ist doch so, als wären die Nazi-Größen in Deutschland heute noch allgemein anerkannt. Denken Sie mal an die Reaktion eines jungen Juden, wenn es heute in Berlin noch eine Adolf-Eichmann-Straße gäbe. Damals wie heute ist die Türkei ein wichtiger Verbündeter. Damals wie heute hält sich die Staatengemeinschaft bei dem Thema Völkermord bedeckt. Auch wenn Länder wie Frankreich, Russland und Deutschland den Genozid inzwischen verurteilt haben. Bis heute hat kein Land die Türkei vor die Forderung gestellt, den Genozid öffentlich anzuerkennen oder gar Gerechtigkeit gegenüber den Armeniern in Form von Wiedergutmachung zu üben. Au premier rang de ces pays, il y a les États-Unis. Die USA steht an der Spitze dieser Länder. Bis 1917 war sie der Türkei gegenüber neutral, hatte im gesamten Land Diplomaten. Die USA verfügt also über zahlreiche Berichte ihrer Konsuln und Botschafter, die sogar veröffentlicht wurden. Sie haben entscheidende Beweise für den Beschluss und die Organisation der Deportation und Vernichtung der Armenier geliefert. Die USA kann somit noch weniger als viele andere Länder die Existenz dieses Genozids ignorieren. Wenn das mächtigste Land der Welt nicht wagt, offen über diesen Völkermord zu sprechen, warum sollte es die Türkei? Nach vielen gescheiterten Anläufen versucht der amerikanische Kongress im Jahr 2007 erneut, den Völkermord per Resolution anzuerkennen. Die Türkei droht daraufhin mit dem Abbruch diplomatischer Beziehungen, zieht ihren Botschafter aus Washington ab. Why all of a sudden was soll plötzlich dieser ganze Wirbel um eine solche Resolution? Der Genozid ist eine Tatsache. Warum ihn nicht anerkennen und nach vorne schauen? Ich fühle mich aber unter Druck gesetzt, so als hinge ein türkisches Schwert über meinem Kopf, wenn ich heute verkehrt abstimme. Auch der heutige Präsident und damalige Senator Barack Obama mischt sich in die Diskussion ein. Für ihn sind die historischen Fakten klar. Diplomatically. 
Dennoch scheitert die Resolution auf Betreiben von Präsident George W. Bush. Seine Außenministerin Condoleezza Rice muss in einer Anhörung Rede und Antwort stehen. Sie und Verteidigungsminister Gates haben den Ausschuss aufgefordert, gegen die Anerkennung des Völkermordes an den Armeniern zu votieren. Nur weil die Türkei ein starker Verbündeter ist? Ist das ein ethischer und moralischer Grund, den Mord an anderthalb Millionen Menschen zu ignorieren? Wir lassen doch auch nicht zu, dass der Holocaust oder die Genozide in Kambodscha und Ruanda nur ein Thema für Historiker sind. Warum überlassen wir allein den Türken die Anerkennung dieses Völkermordes? Als Akademikerin sind mir die Hintergründe klar. Aber als Außenministerin glaube ich, dass es für die Vereinigten Staaten das Beste ist, sich in dieser Sache kein Urteil zu erlauben. Türken und Armenier sollen selbst eine Lösung finden. Und ja, die Türkei ist ein guter Verbündeter. Besonders seit dem Beginn des Irakkrieges sind die USA auf die Türkei und deren Militärbasen angewiesen. Von dort fliegen US-Flugzeuge in den Irak und nach Afghanistan. Die Türkei drohte mit der Schließung des Luftwaffenstützpunktes in Chilik oder damit in den Irak einzumarschieren und die Kurden zu verfolgen, wenn wir die Genozidresolution verhandeln. Unsere Regierungen, sowohl die letzte als auch die gegenwärtige, sind unter diesem Druck eingeknickt und machen uns damit zu Mittätern bei der Leugnung eines Völkermordes. Barack Obama im türkischen Parlament, nun als Präsident der USA. Bei seiner Antrittsrede spricht er den Völkermord an den Armeniern nicht offen an, fordert die Türkei nicht auf, die historischen Tatsachen anzuerkennen. I see a hypocrisy. Es ist reine Heuchelei, den Völkermord an den Armeniern deshalb nicht anzuerkennen, nur weil es einem Verbündeten der USA nicht gefällt. Ich bin enttäuscht, dass der Präsident den Völkermord nicht in aller Form anerkannt hat, denn ich bin davon überzeugt, dass Präsident Obama die Morde und Gräuel als Genozid ansieht. Das hat er als Senator getan und ich kann mir kaum vorstellen, dass sich zwischen seiner Zeit als Senator bis zu seiner Präsidentschaft die historischen Fakten geändert haben. Das Problem für ihn jetzt sind offenbar unsere außenpolitischen Beziehungen mit der Türkei. Die Diskussionen über die Vergangenheit nehmen in der Türkei allerdings immer mehr zu. Das Tabu wird brüchig. Die Regierung reagiert darauf mit der Forderung, dass Historiker erst einmal die Fakten untersuchen sollten. Ganz so, als müsste längst Geklärtes noch einmal überprüft werden. Und als Staatspräsident Gül das kleine Nachbarland Armenien 2008 zum ersten Mal besucht, spricht er nur über Grenzöffnungen und diplomatische Beziehungen. Doch der Völkermord ist für ihn kein Thema. Das ist jetzt alles schon so viele Generationen her. Aber bis heute ist es nicht abgeschlossen. Es gab nie eine Entschuldigung. Nie die einfache menschliche Feststellung, ja, es ist geschehen. Was können wir tun, um das Leid zu lindern? Darüber sollte die türkische Regierung... To the Armenian constituents and to the Republic of Armenia and to the Armenians of the diaspora who are the result of the genocide, what can we do uh, to right the wrong? What can we do in terms of not only opening a frontier that we unilaterally close, that's, that's unrelated, that's irrelevant, but what can we do in terms of remembering and uh, restituting and, uh, and uh, renovating the, the cultural heritage? Rand Dink, the murdered journalist, had tried, with little success, to start a long overdue debate. It cost him his life. But his death sparked a wave of protest. 200,000 Turks took to the streets in one of the biggest demonstrations ever seen in Turkey. In solidarity with Rand Dink, the Armenians, and the longing for truth. It's 
it was very unusual that in this country, having denied many things in the past, that such a campaign could take place. I believe that Turkey, because of its record, because of its history, should be ready, should be bold enough to say, I'm sorry for what has happened. Nobody could imagine that in Turkey, that many people would go on the streets and would say, we're all hunting, we're all Armenians. There is this public who are really raising their voice and, well, the state has to hear it at some point and I think they're hearing it. <laughs>